Hi, good morning. Good morning. Hope you guys are joining. Um, I'm super excited for, um, for my guest today. I'll tell you more about her when she gets on. Her name is Karin Adderson, and she is just the just mind blowing pediatrician and author. And I'll tell you more, but hold on. First, I want to add her. Here we go. Here we are. How's everyone doing? Got your drink of choice? Hey. Hi. 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 You, got, you got on so good. You win the award for for best, um, hold on, best uh, get, getting on the easiest possible. Hold on, I'm just turning up my volume here. Um, the best guest to get on because everyone has gotten on sideways and done like, you know, you know, maybe I've done this before. <laughs> I am so excited to talk to you, Cara. Thank you so much for, uh, for, for getting on today. Thank you um, for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I, I was just telling everybody that's joining. Hi guys. Welcome from India. We've oh, got uh, Michigan. <laughs> awesome. A from Sweden. all over. Florida, Tampa. Hi. Um, so, Dr. Karen Natterson, Natterson is uh, somebody that I had the pleasure of hearing speak live, and I wanted you to be my best friend, as you know, because then I was texting you going, when are we hanging out? Um, we still have to do that. We are going to do that. Yeah. We're do we're it's starting here, okay. and then it's going to continue. Love it. Love but it. Uh, you blew my mind. First of all, you are uh, you know, a, a pediatrician for how many years you were? Well, I became a pediatrician in 1997, so it's been a minute. Okay. It's been a minute. And now you are an author of many things, but most recently it's This Is So Awkward, an incredible yeah. book about puberty um, and, and many, many things, actually, because there's like not even enough time today to talk about all the things I want to ask you. And then also now you have your podcast, um, which you have had, but now it's, it's also called This Is So Awkward, yeah. right? As of yesterday, you are on it. We rebranded it yesterday. It's called This Is So Awkward. And we relaunched our whole website, which is called lessawkward.com. And we actually have started to compile all of our content into a membership oh, that cool. is going live this week. Um, the Less Awkward membership. So anyone who cares about a kid between 8 and 18, um, they can be your child, but they don't have to be. They might be a grandchild. You might be a coach, a mentor, a teacher, a health educator, a healthcare provider. Right. You can get all of this information as a member of the community. So questions that you have at three in the morning that are keeping you up, now there's a reliable place to go. That's. I'm so glad you say that because um, as I was thinking about this today, I thought, you know, there's a lot of, 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 you know, my community that is, that do not have children, a lot of young, a lot of young people, but I sort of feel like there's people that are going into healthcare and people that do have younger siblings or, you know, will one day have children and we have all been through puberty. So, <laughs> like, you know, we can all relate on some That's level. Right. And actually I dress for the occasion. So I'm wearing my daughter's nice. oversized hoodie. Nice. Nice. <laughs> which which seems to be the um, you know the outfit of all teenagers today, no matter eight or eighteen. It's all Correct. about the hoodie. <laughs> it is. I'm not gonna lie. I have inspo for my kids as well. The hoodie is my favorite go-to item. Yes, <laughs> it is comfortable. I Very. must say, I'm kind of like I've adopted it. And there's days where I. I do take on the whole, you know, big sweats and hoodie, and I feel very comfortable in it. So, you know, I agree. It's better I, that than the, some skin tight little. I was gonna you know, say dress that I you can't not, get ourselves into. <laughs> yeah, I have not adopted the crop top. No, they can have that, but the hoodie, bring it. The yes. hoodie, bring it. <laughs> um, so, okay, where do we start? So we there's there's things that I I couple topics that I want to like touch on that you have spoken right. about and then then please uh, chime in with anything that um, I'll I'll see if some questions come up but also right. um, 
I know that you get like so many questions about so many um, evolving topics about uh, this stage in our lives. And so I, I have, um, as you know, my daughter, like your son, is a senior in high school. So we kind of went through that. And you have an older son as well, right? I have an older daughter, daughter who's off at college. Yeah, great. Okay. Okay, so yes, I know they're very high achieving kids. We've got Harvard and Yale in there, right? They are, they are hard workers and um, very lucky kids is what they are, yeah. Well, I, my, and then I do wanna ask you about that afterward, which is just like, what's that little motivating thing? So I do have a question about that. But, um, but besides that, um, yeah, so I have Lucia, which is going off. So I feel like, I feel super accomplished as a parent because I, I do feel that I survived having a teenage girl because yes. I only have one. I'm not gonna go through it again, but I'm here to volunteer for anybody that might <laughs> need any sort of, you know, place to vent or whatever. Cause I do feel like I earned some kind of a degree by going through it. And then now I have a 13 year old son. And so I feel like I'm kind of restarting that process again with a different gender and a different child and yeah. figuring out what that's gonna look like as well. And also a lot happens in these four years in terms of um, culturally, things have also shifted. Yes, I mean, more. Right. I, I will say it's so interesting, the framing, when my first child was born and it was a daughter, I thought, oh, poor, poor thing, this is how adolescence is gonna look for her and I didn't have a pretty idea of it. And how wrong I was, right? So one way in which I'm wrong is that adolescence looks different for everyone. It doesn't matter who they are, what their gender. And the second way I had it wrong is girls, females tend to be in conversation about this stuff much more openly. And so they get to work through a lot of their awkwardness, a lot of their worries, a lot of their concerns. And this generation in particular has done a fabulous job. I mean, they talk about periods openly, like waving around their tampons and talking about what's going on. That is progress. And when I look at my son, he falls into a category of kids who, and some of its personality and some of its probably gender, where he does not talk as much and he and his friends talk openly about some things, but not about the same types of things, not about their bodies, not about their worries in the same way. And I started to really rethink my sort of worries about puberty. And I'm like, I had that backwards. Actually, it's a little harder. I mean, it's not a competition. It's awkward for everyone, but it's a little harder for the kids who don't engage in conversation mm. than it is for the kids who do. Mm. So that to me, that's the goal for any adult who loves a kid is engage in conversation. Mm. Start asking them, not yes, no questions, but start asking them really deep informative questions about what's going on for them because that's what makes the journey less lonely and a little lighter of a lift. It's not ever going to be a super light lift, but, but it's but, a little light. You know, that's, it's a hard thing to do that. Um, you know, I, I, oh, yeah. my family, you know, I'm first generation American and they, they just didn't talk about things. Yeah. And so they, um, so I was totally on my own with my friends and, and I feel like there's so many things I learned from my friends and not my parents, which I, yep. you know, I, I wish it wasn't that way. So I, but they just weren't comfortable. They didn't, that wasn't something that they were willing to sit down and do. And I feel like I've been totally the polar opposite with my children. Yep. Like I am TMI. I call it out. No. I'm like, oh no, 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 no. <laughs> so when this thing happens, like I said something to my son the other day about, you know, drugs and vaping. And so you're going to go in eighth grade and you might hear this and you might hear this or this about sex. You And he just, he had this look on his face like, oh my gosh, mom, like, what are you doing? And I, and I said, <clears throat> I'd rather you hear it from me. Don't yes. be embarrassed. We've all gone through it. You're going to hear stuff. And I want you to know that you can come to us and we'll answer any questions. I'd rather you hear that than, you know, not. Okay. So here's what you did really well there. What you did really well is you made it really clear that nothing is off limits for you. No. And that is a win. 
Because if you're willing to engage in those very hard topics, even if you're just sort of throwing it out there and then you leave it and it's done, the conversation is one sentence and you're done and you're out, you have established that they really can come and talk to you. Yeah. And I encourage anyone who's on here, I mean, anyone who's on here who's taking time in the middle of their day to watch this is someone who is hungry to connect with a kid just do that. Just say like, uh, it, and if I don't know the answer, by the way, we'll look it up together or I'll look it up and I'll get back to you. Right. Yeah. But just, just letting them know you can be a go-to. Can you imagine the relief you would have felt if you knew that when you were a kid, oh, there was an adult. Like so and by the way, even if you don't have the answer, that was a really good piece of advice that I think I got, which was, which was that, that it's okay to say, you know, I don't know, but let me, let me research it or let me think about it and totally. I'll get back to you. And then sort of having a moment to digest what would be the right way to approach that was, um, is a super important piece even, of, you know. Even if you're freaking out, freaking like if you're out. Oh my in God. your head going, oh my, my kid just said what? Yeah. You just like, fake it till you make it cool on the outside, go pull yourself together. You can totally, share that you're freaking out at some point with your kid but if you share it in the moment they feel embarrassed or ashamed and so just keep that a little bit locked down so on that note i just i want you to sh i want you to talk a, t a little bit about sort of the brain and your scientific uh, expertise on this, because I do think, and this is what I got from your book and from you and Vanessa's, I mean, first of all, you guys have to follow them because they're, you're both hilarious. And what I love is how accessible and funny you are on the topic. It's not like doom and gloom. It really is, um, it really helps you sort of look at the stage of your child's development as development and as something that you can participate in. And it's okay, like even, and I'll ask you that later, you know, when, when they go through the phases of not liking you, what are tools that we can, you know, use to help ourselves not feel so bad? And so I love your approach, it's amazing. Um, but I want you to talk about the um, maturity, the maturity of the brain, because I think that a lot of people don't understand how, um, how different the female and male brains, the timing of it all. Yeah how that plays into maturity. And that okay. maturity is something that each child, it's individual to everybody. Yeah. And we have to have the uh, understanding of that in order to, to be not just good parents, but caretakers or anything. So, okay, okay. so you ready? Let's do this. Okay. <laughs> okay, no matter what your gender, the brain matures in two ways. So the first is something called pruning. You're born with way too many neurons, then you grow even more neurons when you're a toddler. And then for the rest of your life, the brain is pruning down. It is getting rid of neurons that you don't use and keeping the ones you use. Like a tree gets pruned, your brain gets pruned. That's one way your brain matures. And that happens through your whole life. The second way your brain matures is something called myelination. So myelin is the, insulation layer that covers the neurons in your brain. It's like, here, I'm gonna hold up my phone charger, right? My phone charger, it has this plastic coating and inside is a wire. So a naked wire, the message can get sent and, and sort of weakened as it's sent because it just sort of, um, it, it's not insulated, it's not an efficient way of sending a message. An insulated wire can send a message really, really quickly. Your brain insulates itself between birth and the age of 28, 29, 30. It takes almost till you're 30 in order for all the myelin to grow all over your brain. Crazy, it, that's so crazy. crazy right? <laughs> and it myelinates from the bottom to the top and from the inside out. So when a kid is about 10 or 11 or 12, their myelin has made it about halfway up and halfway out. That part of the brain which is myelinated, is the emotional center of the brain. It's called the limbic system. There are a bunch of different structures in there. And that's the part that can send and receive signals the fastest when you're a tween and a teen. 
The part that is not mature is the part all the way out here, the prefrontal cortex. That's the part that makes the really smart long-term consequential decisions. So now there's an imbalance. The emotional brain is mature and the smart consequential brain is not. Okay, that explains your teen years, right? That's why we make impulsive decisions and bad decisions because our brains are wired to do things that feel good but aren't necessarily gonna help us in the long run. Okay, now you add in the sex hormones. So for people who have estrogen and progesterone coursing through their bodies, because females who have ovaries make estrogen and progesterone, and those hormones are in charge of puberty. Those hormones go up to the brain and they change the way the brain, the neurons in the brain work together. They change the way you feel, they change your moods. Meanwhile, if you've got testicles, you're making testosterone. And that hormone goes up to your brain, and that changes the way the neurons fire, and that changes the way you feel. So now you put it all together, and you've got these tweens and teens and 20-somethings, and they have these developing brains that are about halfway cooked, and they are soaked in hormone that is changing the way it feels. That, Sasha, is what you're seeing. That's yeah. what you're living in your house. Those are the age differences we see and the gender differences we see with brain development. Um, at at um, uh, my daughter's school, they, they had a wonderful uh, uh, sort of example. They would put this jar of glitter and they'd shake it up and they'd say, this is your child's brain right now. So like when a parent was freaking out that something was going on with their kid, they'd be like, just take it easy. This is their brain. <laughs> That's right. I, that always stuck with me because I thought it, it really mattered to kind of think about, um, we, we often sort of go, oh my goodness, I'm like, I'm failing at this right now. I'm not being a good parent. That's I right. totally messed this up. I don't understand this. And we go through, which I think you've talked about before, we start to relive our own puberty, but it's not our puberty. We went through it. It's our kids. <laughs> okay. So, so important because we carry the battle scars of our own puberty, right? Like if I say, think about your own puberty, you're going to not flash back to the warm, fuzzy, happy memory. The first thing you're going to flash back to is the most traumatic, most awkward, right? The thing that you're like, ah, puberty. Yeah. That, we got to let that go, okay? Yeah. We've, got to, we've got to leave that at the door. This is not, we're not reliving and rewriting our own adolescence. We're helping our yeah. kids. We're helping the kids in our lives who we love and care about. Yeah, that's that's super important because I, I I think if there's anything that I see parents around me th that they everyone does that particularly for some reason. Well, me, I've seen I've seen men do it with their sons, but I've also seen moms do it, and yeah. that folds into a little bit of a topic I want to talk to you about, which is um, you you talked a lot about I've, I've heard you talk about um, how. And I don't want to like spend too much time on social media, yeah. but it's really about technology and also also the information that all these kids are getting, how that is affecting um, th that we are deriving and kids are deriving their sense of self and validation, everything yeah. from strangers, yeah. right? From people yeah. that don't know them, whether that's hypersexualization yeah. or anything else. But one of the things that I feel that folds into this question is, is that, which is that if we as a parent like went through school and we were not, you know, the homecoming queen or whatever, it's like, we're super excited if our daughter looks like she could be. And we're pushing our kids towards an image of something or not even just the image of, of, of an identity of something that's not who they are. And so not only does a child in today's environment, in today's, um, world have that parental pressure, which always exists, but they also have a societal pressure, which is on a hyper, hyper level now that it has never been on. Like there's always that's, been. That's it. That. But this is now like pumped up and we wonder why the kids' brains are just like, like imploding. They got it has to quiet down. And so that's right. Anyway, that's, so, 
And, and I'm going to add to your scenario. So you're exactly right. Like there are parental expectations and pressures. There are friend expectations and pressures that have always existed. Then there's the social media of it all, which amplifies it because on certain platforms, for sure, people are showing their best lives. Now there are platforms where they're not showing their best lives. They're showing, you know, there are platforms where they're silly or they change their face to look whatever, like a, like a, an elf yeah. or, you know, whatnot. Yeah. There's, certain, there's a sort of innocence about that. Yeah. There's something fun and irreverent about that. But I want to, I want to add one, one piece to it, which is it's 24 seven. So when we were growing up, the pressures that we felt were really Monday through Friday from eight to three. It was school based. And maybe after school, as we got older, there were pieces mm -hmm. that sort of factored in. But as we sort of have evolved this technology and as social media has really grown to become a massive part of the adolescent experience, what it has done is it has taken this social world to a 24 seven scenario. And that's exhausting. Exhausting. It's exhausting. And if there's one piece of advice I can give every single person who's listening, and this is for kids in your life, but it's also for you, put your devices away at night. 100%. Because that's the only way you can give yourself a break. It's so hard otherwise. And these kids, I mean, can you imagine what it's yeah. like growing up with that input coming in constantly? Yeah. I mean, no, it's, it's too much. When we gave our daughter uh, her phone, which was, thir both our kids got it at 13. We, um, she, both of, both of them have to plug it in into our room. So there's no access for yep. sure uh, by a certain time. And I remember when our daughter, so she was in eighth grade and her plug-in time was, let's say, 8.30. Like it was early, nine, maybe, maybe. Yep. I don't even think so because she needed like a little bit of like wind down time. Yep. No, a lot do. of her friends did not have those guardrails yeah. and often they would stay up till 11 or whatever. And I thought, how does a child function staring at that and then trying to go to sleep and then waking up at 6.37 it's like too much. I mean, I, I'm exhausted. There, and I, I'm not a child. There are a lot of studies that show that kids actually don't sleep as well or as deeply yeah. when there's a device in the room. By the way, it doesn't have to be a phone. It could be a laptop. It can be an iPad. It could be anything. Yeah. So, but the same data applies to you and me. We don't sleep as well right. when the devices are in our room. So that that is a great strategy is like picking a time and logging off. You are going to hear from the kids in your life it's not fair. Everyone is doing it a different way. Everyone is on this platform. Everyone is that. And there's no judgment here. There's no room for judgment here. It's like, you've got to do what's right for you and for the kids in your life. And so I, I strongly encourage keeping the conversation focused on, hey, my job is you. My job is not them. Like, they'll do their thing. We're doing our thing over here. Uh, that's the only way really to raise non-judgmental kids as well is if we model it from our own homes or our own um, spaces where we share our time with these kids. But it's hard. It's really it's hard. It's so hard. You know, the other thing that, that that makes me think of as well is that, you know, that piece of us that um, that can't, the parents that can't say no, like you can't say no to taking the phone away and putting it in another room, or you can't say no to your child walking out of the house wearing something that you sort of think is like, okay, maybe that's not appropriate for this occasion, you know? And, and by the way, that could be my son the other day, we were going to a really nice dinner with the family and I was like, yeah, it's not like a hoodie and jeans occasion. Like I actually think I'd like for you to wear a polo or a button, something just like, like there are different occasions for things. So that's our rule. There are so many parents that just aren't saying no, and they are not comfortable. They're not comfortable yeah. with what their daughter's wearing to something, and they don't say anything. And I'm thinking, why? Why are you not saying no? Okay, so here's one hurdle. One hurdle is if you've allowed a kid to do something, and then you realize it was a really bad decision, it sometimes feels like that decision is in cement, and you can't undo it. I'm here to tell you, you can take a do-over on a hundred percent on yeah. anything. So that's 
that's one savior for people who go, oh, I really messed this up. I really should have said to my kid, no phone or no social media or, you know, no tube top at dinner with the grandparents or whatever it is. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Take, take your do over take it i and you can say i got that totally wrong this is a big cred builder right. with adolescents right i messed that one up so royally sorry gonna take a do-over trying it again a different way let's see how this goes and you know what that also helps them see everyone always says to kids like failure is so important and you should fail that's the only way you learn and then we don't let them fail well if we model that we screwed it up and that we have failed in some decisions that we've made for them, that is the surest way to show them they can absolutely fail and it is fine and recoverable. Yeah, Cara, I love that. You know, somebody just wrote, wellness and self-care tools are needed for families too. And I, I really, but I agree with you. I very often, I when I was, in my teens, I do remember what bugged me the most was one was being lied to or like gaslit in a way that not on purpose, but like Hang on, Sasha, I lost your there. I was wrong about that and, and I changed my more I've changed my mind. I thought I had the answer to that and I don't and yep. we're going to change the rules and we're going to say, and this is why <laughs> I did that all the time. And I right. continue to do that because I don't think that I'm like, you know, the, the, the queen of parenting, I don't know everything. And so often there's something that happens and I say, you know what, now that I've thought about it, I feel more comfortable with this and I'm sorry, okay. I don't agree with that, but this is, this is what it's going to be. I have a good modern day example. So, AI. Okay. So a year ago, we might have said to a kid, AI is equivalent to cheating. You can't use AI. That's cheating. Now in school, what they're learning and what a lot of educators are embracing is AI is everywhere. So how are we going to use AI and how are we going to redefine what it means to use AI so that kids can have a tool and figure out where it's good and where it's bad and where it knows something and where it doesn't know something. And that's a great example of if we weren't willing to do take a do-over, we'd be back in last year's world saying AI bad and all the kids would be going, I'm tuning you out now because everyone is using AI. Right. So we have to evolve with the times and it goes across every corner of kids' life experience in the classroom, outside of the classroom. Self-care is huge, huge, huge. Mm -hmm. I, also, I also think that, um, and I was having this conversation with a friend, I, I think also um, the words that we use, which is why it's so important to have these conversations with someone like you, who understands and has put together the words that we can use as tools in these moments, right? Um, and so I have a friend that like, she'll just say, the phone's bad, you're ruining your life, blah, 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 like put it down, this and that, instead of, hey, I feel like it's been, you know, we spent this much time on it, have you checked your time on it? And I would really love you to make the decision to put that down right now or whatever it is. And I feel like sometimes I engage in that uh, with both my kids in different ways. My son tends to be, he just got a phone, so we'll see what that's like. But, um, but with my daughter, we got a lot of fights. Like, I mean, one time I, it was always over that phone, like put the yeah. phone down, put the thing down. And it was right at the height. I mean, it was right in that eighth, ninth grade moment when I felt like, and it was COVID, it was the only way to connect. So it was, it was difficult. Um, and, but I do feel like sometimes the way we approach it, like trying to, trying to gather ourselves before we like explode, because I do feel like a lot of parents feel so bad after they've had an explosion that they didn't mean to. And then they're like reeling back. Yeah. And then instead of reeling back and saying, okay, I'm gonna stick to my guns on this, they reel back entirely and then like, here you go, have three phones, have it as long as you okay. want. You bring up the best point. So first of all, my advice is never be afraid to apologize to a kid. You're gonna get it wrong. 
you're gonna get it wrong. And a lot of us were raised in homes where we were taught apologizing weakened our stature. Like if we said, I'm sorry, somehow that undermined us. No, no, you're totally allowed to A, mess up and B, say, I'm really sorry. And once you start doing that, you will see a shift in the way that kids respond, right? Because you're treating them like they're human. So that's number one. Number two is you are so right that sometimes what happens is when we do something that we should be apologizing for or that's wrong, our reaction is to overcompensate. So maybe we let them do more down the same road that we were worried about. Maybe we do overcompensate with something totally different, like, well, I'm not gonna give you the phone, but I am gonna go take you shopping. And then we're like, what are we doing? What are we, right? what are we doing? What are we doing? So it's okay to just take a second. You know, we talked about brain maturation. Time allows signals to get everywhere in the brain. Just a few seconds allows you to center and really collect your thoughts. That's what that phrase means. It's allowing all the signals to go to every corner of your brain. So take advantage of time. Say to your kid, I just need a minute to collect my thoughts, or I need an hour to collect my thoughts. I'm gonna come back and we're gonna talk about this again and we're gonna figure this out. Then you won't be suddenly going down a road where you're like, oh, I just created five problems when I was trying to solve one. one. And we all like, Look, we love these kids. I've been a pediatrician for so many years. I've literally never met a parent or trusted adult who doesn't want the kid in their life to be happy. Like, 100%. Ever. So 100%. That's the goal, right? Mm -hmm. But sometimes we lose our way. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. I also I also think it's hard, you know, we have to have uh patients also as my as my children got older um i now can say to them some my son's super sensitive and he'll say hey mom are you okay like are, how was your day like are, are you in a bad mood and i'm not at all right. like it just might be the way my face looks at that moment i said no sweetheart not at all or or i yes i've had a really hard day mm -hmm. and right. my mind is on this other thing nothing to do with That's you so, so sorry that you're feeling that, but wow, how great that you're so sensitive and thank you for checking in. Like, how I mean, cool is that, it's you know? So, so cool, actually, to have that dynamic and to be raising someone or engaged in life with someone who can then take that and reflect it other places and check in with other people about their feelings. Like, isn't that everything? It's everything, everything you know? And also, I think it's so important to also, and also tell our children that it's like, not everything is about them. Like we think everybody's feelings are about them. And, and I'm seeing parents who their child has a problem in school yeah. and they make it about them. And I've had to say to friends, this isn't about you. You know, you're not actually in school with them, seeing what's really going on. Like, yes, maybe a lot of those kids are misbehaving, and but maybe your kid contributed or didn't. We don't know because we're not there. So how about that we just sort of come from a place of all the kids are wonderful little souls who are just trying to figure it out. And That's they're it. all colors of the rainbow. So everybody sort of does it in a different way. And they have different characters. But like, it's not all about you as well. That kid might be going through something that we have no idea what that is. And so I often remind my kids to kind of pull it back and not make it about them. In, it's not all about them. In fact, it might have nothing thing to right. do with most you. likely <laughs> their life is very full and they are totally entitled to feel like the world of their friends and their um schoolmates and all that have piled onto them and then when you personalize it you're just one more body on the pile on and it's like oh my goodness that is not the goal no. so yeah remove yourself from that equation i mean not entirely sometimes it is on you and you have to take some responsibility oh, yeah. 100 percent. Um, right but when it's not um okay so one question um that uh somebody asked is um what they're going through uh the phase where the children just all of a sudden don't like don't they don't like you anymore they just don't like you 
they're like ninth, tenth grade, eighth grade, whatever it is, and they're they're just they're also quite open about it. And so I was joking, and I said, "Oh, you mean the moment when like even your breath stimulates hate? Like they somehow don't everything you do bothers them? Um, how do we manage that and not feel terrible about ourselves?" <laughs> I find the question hilarious because you're like, "What if?" And I'm just here to tell you, it's a hundred percent going to happen to everyone. Okay. <laughs> I mean. That's, that's part of the process of them growing up. They, first of all, they push back on the people who keep them feeling the safest. Right, right. Just think about that for a second. The people in your life, in your life, who make you feel like you are safe with them are the people with whom you can let down and be real. No different for our kids. So it feels horrible. But that's the reality is they will push back against the safe person. The second thing is their hormones are rising and falling and rising and falling. And it feels bad in their brains. That surge of hormone feels terrible and it feels a little out of control. Mm -hmm. So sometimes they actually can't help themselves. Mm -hmm. They really can't help themselves. Aliza Pressman, who has a podcast called Raising Good Humans, love her. She's an right. amazing advice. She has a line that I think is one of the best lines of all time. I use it all the time in my house. And the line is, all feelings are welcome, all behaviors are not. Mm. So they're allowed to feel whatever they feel. Mm -hmm. But can they be mean? Can they be nasty? Can they be hurtful? That's not okay. But they're allowed to Feel it and they have to learn where that line is so Aliza gives great advice and I will tell anyone who's interested in this topic to go check out her podcast awesome it's awesome awesome uh, somebody just asked the question of um, what and you can answer this because your kids are there and gone through there what am I doing to prepare Lucia for college and so I, I feel like that's like you know it's a heavy question because I'm right in the thick of it for the first time. Yeah. Um, but I would love any advice that you have because I feel like uh, right now I'm just celebrating her wins and I'm celebrating yeah. the excitement for this new phase and her getting into a university that she's so excited to go to. And I feel like, um, but she is going to be living six hours away yeah. um, from me on a plane. And it's so it's all like, I feel a lot of pride, but I also feel uh, a heartbreak yeah. Um, in it. Yeah. So, so I'll give you a few pointers. Um, the first is you've been working at this for a long time. So you have, you know, Vanessa would say, you've got a lot of money in the bank there. You've got, there's a lot of investment that she gets to spend when she's away that you've spent 17, 18 years investing in. So that's amazing. Um, the second is, while celebrating her wins now is important, grabbing these tough conversations more frequently is also really important. Um, there was an editorial in the New York Times um, that came out on Sunday, Peggy Ornstein wrote it. Um, it was about sexual violence and choking. It's a great example oh, of a yes, topic. I, yes, I, 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 yes. An amazing article. Yeah. It is a really hard topic. You got a kid who's about to leave your house for college, for a job, for a program somewhere, Articles like that yeah. are articles that you should yeah. both read and then yeah. come together and talk about because these are the, there are a lot of scary topics. These are some of the scary topics. So we're talking about things like fentanyl and how they can protect, yeah. right? So like all the big, yeah. um, big topics are things you do want to cover. Um, there's a site called Grown and Flown, which is so wonderful. Um, it's run by two women, Mary Del Heffernan and, um, I'm write and sorry, Mary. Mary Dell and Lisa Hevernan. Um, and the Grown and Flown is a wonderful set of resources for parents whose kids are at that age where they're starting to launch. So I point you there. Wonderful yes. community of parents. And then finally, you got to keep them safe in terms of their health. So um, there are great books available, like the College Student Health Handbook, which we love and talk about a lot on our podcast. Um, but giving them resources so that they know they can get help in the moment really works. My daughter is six hours away on a plane as I well. Know. Um, 
You know, we've been doing this for two years. Some of the best conversations I've ever had with her in her entire life have happened from afar. So you don't have to be in the same space. In fact, not looking each other in the eye is a really powerful and easy way into conversation. And sometimes you can have the most meaningful connection by text or by FaceTime or just on, shocker, a regular phone call. You know what, that's so, that's so great to hear. Thank you, that makes me feel so much better. That's so great to hear. Um, uh, I just want to, uh, some, some questions were regarding, you know, and we're not going to get into this, but, you know, you, you know, certain universities, as we talked about, your kids at Harvard and Yale and everything. And I just want to say that, like, my perspective on this whole university thing, which is an entirely different topic. And as a matter of fact, I kind of want to interview my own child if she's willing to do it, because I feel that her experience going through it and seeing all of her friends at public, private schools, anywhere around the world, kids from all over the world, even my nephew going through it now, uh, have such an interesting perspective. Oh, yeah. And I want to say that it has all changed in terms of uh, it's, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter where you go. It matters that you're going somewhere that you are excited to learn, meet people that share similar values or whatever that is and also just extend your learning. Like you're going from high school to a space that hopefully is gonna be a more independent space, it's away from parents, and it's continued education. So I just wanna say that this is not about Ivy League schools. This is about anywhere. Like I, yeah. I have friends I have friends who went to Ivy's and then their kids don't want to go and they're gonna to go to a junior college and then transfer when they're ready. And I personally told my child to apply to all European schools because I was like, I don't know what's going to happen here, but go apply. And I just want you to enjoy your life and I want you to continue to learn. So whatever that is for you individually, you know, yeah, I think, I think the world has somehow made college a destination. Mm -hmm. It is not. It is a step on the path and it's yes, a step on the path for some, there are a lot of people who take a totally different path. So, if we can all lower the stakes here and we can all make it about the journey of their life, I think it's much healthier for them. It's certainly healthier for us, um, but it requires a, a commitment for, by everyone, by the educators, by the colleges, by the kids and yeah. by the parents to just Chillax. take a breath. <laughs> and like, it's, it's really because we are in a mental health emergency right, right now 100%. this is not helpful no. this is not helpful no. so um there are lots of wonderful paths and there none of them are straight lines no none of them no not matter how direct you think your kid is going oh they're doing this and they're going to be this major and they're going to get this job you know what we all know life is not a straight path it is not and i that's exactly what i said to my kid going into junior year when i realized because both my husband and I didn't, he was coming out, coming from Europe, he didn't go through this experience. So he had nothing to draw from. And mine was like, he applied to one or two schools and that was it. And now you're applying to over 10 schools and it's this whole thing that goes on. And I just, I felt it. And the only thing that mattered was that was her mental health to me. And I said, whoa, we are not yeah. participating in that game. Yeah. That is, like, that is a game that has no, I don't know what that is. It's, it's, and it's far too much uh, pressure for an entire year and a half, potentially two years right. of your life, of your childhood, for something that it doesn't, you know, just because you go, I've seen so many kids go somewhere and then they're unhappy and they change. Yeah. So who knows, yeah. right? All, all we care about is, and yeah. If you, you know, to like come full circle on the conversation, if their brains aren't done developing until they're in their late 20s, almost 30, yeah. well then, they're just in progress when all this is happening and maybe what we think is right for them or what they think is right for them they get there and it's not okay you know yeah. things change so a lot of permission to take do-overs in every direction keep conversations open this is you know the the relationship between an adult and a child doesn't go away when that child becomes a young adult it yeah. just changes it just morphs and that's the goal and back to what you said communication listening and um and all that continues right i mean it doesn't stop we're doing it now i'm literally doing 
these, these conversations because yes. I'm constantly having interesting, uh, you know, conversations with people that I we do and having you and Vanessa out there kind of talking about this just makes us feel less alone in it and so thank you so much thank like I could you. talk to you all day and I will call you later with another question yeah <laughs> do this again soon but thank you so much and I'm glad to see you out there you guys have just been like you know I'm so glad that people are getting exposed more and more to to everything that you're talking about and so listen to her podcast this is so awkward and um and thank you Kara. i appreciate it and you thank you sasha i love the microphone that you have this audience is amazing and so engaged from all over the world they are they are thank you thank you thank you thank you my dear have a wonderful day bye guys bye. see you soon bye, bye.